Hello and welcome to another edition of the Rest is Entertainment Questions Edition. Questions and Answers Edition. Um, I'm Richard Osman. I'm Marina Hyde. Um, hey Marina. Hello. How are you? I'm, uh, I'm over my jet lag now. I'm very pleased to hear you're over your jet lag. I think we should get straight into this. Can I say one thing, yeah. by the way? I was thinking, when I had that jet lag, I was thinking, oh, actually, I'm a, I felt like I had a bit of a cold. And it made me think that thing of, if you're a quiz show presenter, so no one's asked this question, but I'm going to answer it anyway. When you're a quiz show presenter and you have a cold, people think you're very, very ill. Because if you had a cold for three days, then actually on a TV show, that means 15 episodes. So they're like, my God, he has had a cold for a really, really It's a chronic time. illness. It's a chronic illness. Anyway, that's what that made me think. Yes, but very no good. one wrote that question. We got questions about literally everything else, but no one said, what happens when a TV presenter gets a cold? Shall we start with this question from Craig Walker? Thank you so much, Craig. Why do you think sketch shows no longer exist? I grew up watching Goodness Gracious Me, The Fast Show, Smack the Pony, Sketch Show, etc. all 20 plus years ago. How and why did British comedy change to leave behind that legacy? Partly what it is, is a rather boring answer. And then it's become perhaps a slightly more interesting answer is that money it is so expensive to put these things on and the pool of money available for things like that has become smaller what has become bigger is stand-up is huge and people going into comedy might be going more towards the in the direction of stand-up because stand-up is so huge if you're making a sketch show what you need is little troops of people to build one of these shows around who are out there on the circuit and if, there aren't, if they aren't there because they've gone in the direction of stand-up, then you haven't necessarily got these people around whom you can build a show. It's very expensive because you've got multiple, multiple sets, costumes. People don't want to watch something where it almost looks like they're watching a sort of kind of cheap panto and they're just pulling on costumes to give you the basic idea of the character. It, it, it takes a lot of time to do all of it. And I suppose that's part of the reason it fell out of favour. Funnily enough, I did watch a show recently called something like Deep Fake Neighbour Wars, I think it is. And it's it's a really, it's a really like, it's dark. It's an AI sort of show. And there's a Neighbour Wars show, some strand, which I think is internationally sold as a format. Of, and they put celebrities' faces onto these people and had them arguing. I have to say, I didn't like it, but... <laughs> It, I did think about halfway through, oh, I see I'm watching a sketch show, which is something I haven't watched for a very long time. Money is, is, is of course, the answer. You get huge sets, costumes, and, and for a two-minute thing, whereas in a, a sitcom, you know, you use your sets over and over and over again. So it, it's it's very, very expensive to do. It's very difficult to write because, you know, writing 24 one-minute sketches takes longer than writing one 24-minute episode of a sitcom. Certainly more expensive to film in a sketch show as well by and large everyone has equal billing and so it's, qu it's quite expensive as well because yeah. you've got you've got an awful lot of cast but yeah two things so look at ghosts and that's essentially a sketch troupe you know who grew up on horrible histories yeah. which by the way is one of the best sketch shows of all time they made one of the best sitcoms of the 21st century one of the best ever british sitcoms ghosts i think we can safely say now and it comes out of the tradition of sketch comedy which is broad characters catchphrases you know and so i think people are going in that direction but also in the world of youtube and the other platforms there's so many sketches out there now there's so many great character stuff so many amazing sketches and i think probably the world of sketch shows is going to come back because it's going to get cheaper and cheaper to film that will mean it will there'll be less time between maybe filming it and transmission because yeah. one of the great things about all these platforms is that things can be so immediate you yeah. can write you can make a funny sketch and someone can see it straight away now this was this never existed before yeah. we couldn't have this and it's quite hard in lots of ways to keep up the pay you know to keep up that to being au courant being funny being about the thing that's just happened when yeah. it might not be aired for nine months after you shot it yeah exactly that and by the way there is a brilliant sketch show on netflix which is uh, tim robinson's i think you should leave which is it's lunatic uh, so it, it, it wouldn't be for everybody but it certainly it takes um every initial premise of every sketch it does and absolutely grinds it to the f absolute further outer limits of, of, of what you can do with comedy um if you like it you'll love it if you don't like it i would after the first five minutes you, you please feel free to switch it off but yeah it's it's as so often is the answer it's it's economics and also you know that world you know the, the ones that craig mentions there goodness gracious me fast show you know that that's that world of linear TV has, has, has sort of passed us by. But I think the future for sketches is very positive because it's, as you say, you can write it in the morning, film it in the afternoon, put it out in the evening. And, you, you know, you, you can't do that with a sitcom. I've got one for you. Richard Horn says, do you get to keep the prizes in Taskmaster that the contestants are brought in? Oh, that is a good question. By the way, Richard Horn, 
So little used, Alex's he's, brother. He's used my first name and little Alex one's surname. Yeah, I think that's a pseudonym. Um, yeah, it's a, uh, we could probably do a deep dive on Taskmaster because I get I asked about that, it by all the, way. the time. Perhaps we'll do a, um, an episode at, I'm at so some obsessed point. With it. I want to, I, okay, I'd like to do that. It's a load of fun. I'll say that. Uh, it's uh, well, you know what? I'm going to save a lot of this for the uh, for our special for our emergency podcast um, about Taskmaster. Um, if if I if we do it, can I call it an emergency podcast? Otherwise, I'm not doing it. Don't negotiate with me on this thing. No, no, I'm taking my, I'm taking, no, I'm, we, no, we can't do it. Then. Okay, I'm going to talk about everything now then. Uh, you do not get to keep the prizes. There's such a lot of pressure on the prizes though, because, you know, they yeah. say beforehand, you know, what's the, I can't remember on mine, but you do think you genuinely want the points from Greg. And obviously, you know, he's got, he, he, Greg has his, you know, he's very capricious and, you know, will do exactly what he wants. But you do, if you get one point, you, you kind of want to go, Your Honour. That was a, that was a really that you have to bring in your your favourite blue thing, my mm. um, one of mine, and my son be, because this is his personality type and, and an antique shop had bought a police riot helmet right because he saw the police riot helmet I say it's his personality it's mine as well yeah I I looked at it I was like hold on and and my boy was like uh uh can, sorry can we actually buy that I said like, I think we can and so he bought it uh, and it was blue and so I took it in and I thought well this is to me. Five points. That's, that's the best blue thing ever, especially as I said, and my son bought it. Um, yeah. So come on. And he went, well, that's getting one point. And my son was there. That was like the episode <laughs> he came to. I was like, whoa, that is actually, that has actually broken me, Greg. But uh, He I, is a hard taskmaster. I, that is quite simply. <laughs> he literally is. Yeah. We will go into much more detail on taskmaster. It's funny. I, I will say this. Um, I said to Alex Horn recently, I was on a, my US book tour, and so many people in the queue asked about Taskmaster. Yeah. Uh, I was I, I did an event in uh, I think Nashville, where, w- w- one of the places, and you'd get all the questions afterwards. And um, this woman stood up, like, like the third question, just say, can I first say congratulations on how, how you did the yoga balls task in Taskmaster? And ha- <laughs> and literally half of this big audience started in applauding. In Nashville? Yeah. Oh, my God, yeah. that's incredible. It was crazy. So okay. I had that, and uh, just getting back from uh, a book tour in India, and it was the same. There were people there just going, by the way, can I just say, they, there's two shows they love everywhere in the world, Would I Lie to You and Taskmaster. What and a those, show. Those right. are the two okay. shows they say. But no, you, you do not get to, um, uh, because people put up their car or their kids or something. So it would be, <laughs> I mean, some of the stuff that, yeah, I might have won or lost. Yeah, I've seen bathroom suites. I've seen, yeah, there's a lot that, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, just can't sling it in the taxi. Or I mean, I, put, I think you have to have your best piece of celebrity memorabilia. And I, I put up a one of my favorite things in the world which is which is a strongbow cider promotional poster of jockey wilson that he signed honestly if i'd lost that i would have been devastated yeah. cuz it's hard to replace it's up in my living room it's, it's it's one of my favorite things in the world so no you are fortunately uh you get to hold on to to what you've got but yeah so let's definitely do cuz people people love taskmaster maybe we'll get like alex on or something well they've got their own podcast haven't they so yeah they, they probably wouldn't let us, but we'll give but, it a go, no, eh? <laughs> yeah. We've never had a guest, have we? Never had a guest. First one yeah. should be Alex Horn. Yeah, and and the only guest. just Yeah, just the only person we've ever had on the show before yeah. or since. But th- three times a week, we'll do the regular show on Tuesday, we'll do question and answer on Thursday, and we'll interview Alex Horn every Friday. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have a question for you, uh, Marina. This is also a very suspicious name. Dave Gorman asks, can't be the real Dave Gorman. I hope it is. Yeah, he was. Let's pretend it is. Uh, he was on Taskmaster. Thanks, Dave, for your uh, your question. Um, Dave Gorman, the comedian, asks poss- possibly the comedian asks, "How does product placement work? I see it in a lot of shows. What can a show or film make from it?" Well, there are a lot of rules on product placement in television. It's interesting in films and. Because of a thing, a show I'm working on, I ended up doing quite a lot of research on, you know, Marvel's product placement. And, I mean, they make huge amounts of money from it. Um, and sometimes they'll, like, leave a chiller cabinet blank and then you'll add the thing in post-production. Oh, oh that's cool. Because there's a sort of huge competition for what, you know, what's going to be in the chiller cabinet. And also certain movies have kind of established product placement that comes back each time. If you think of something like James Bond, you know, he's going to have a certain type of watch, he's going to have a car. He's got, he's got, he needs a car, he? He needs he, a car, he needs a car. He does, listen, and when, he, can, he cannot rely on Uber. He cannot. He's a spy. But when the, the people, um, the, the cars are slightly different, obviously, because that's uh, uh, extensive filming, those action sequences. But things like the watches, when the people come on set with the watch, or in any other film where they've got a sort of, certain, uh, Dr. Strange had a certain type of fancy watch, 
five guys will come on set. They'll have, you know, the, it will be all chained to their briefcase, will be chained to their thing. And they'll make a really big thing about like checking the watch is being lit in the right way that you can see. It's really wow. meticulously done. And as I say, it's big business. You make a lot of money from this. Um, but there are also things that are these kind of, I suppose you might call it sort of soft power product product mm. placement. So in Marvel, they've done a lot of work with the Pentagon. And there are certain movies that um, kind of effectively promote those kind of things. One thing that was quite interesting, this is just a side note, but I thought it was quite funny. At a certain point, the Pentagon stopped cooperating because they couldn't work out where S.H.I.E.L.D. would come in the hierarchy with the Pentagon and would the Pentagon technically, and I think they concluded that it seemed like the Pentagon might actually have to answer to S.H.I.E.L.D. and at that point they were out. Wow. Yeah, it's fascinating, isn't it? So there's quite a lot of that sort of thing. Um, and sometimes they have huge sort of, uh, they say, well, hang on, would this brand exist in Gotham City? And they will talk for a long time about whether they can have the product because they can, they, to some extent, it's a, um, it's supposed to be a quite lifelike world, but obviously superheroes exist. And although Batman, as we know, has not got any superpowers, he is a costumed vigilante. But mm -hmm. could, the, could this exist in Gotham City? Sometimes um, there are um, promotions just for foreign markets. So people will pay huge amounts to have there, there was a sort of, I think there was a, was it a Japanese jewelry store, Chinese jewelry store, that paid, paid huge amounts of money to allow themselves to be in the background of a shot or blown up in a shot in a Marvel movie, which was only in the, whatever the China release was. or um, And that's something we must talk about on a future episode is um, how films get released in China, which is something that people really, really want. So anyway, that's just a little note to myself. But um, <laughs> there are many in different markets and um, sometimes they kind of get away with it, but in general, people will tolerate some, but they don't like it when it's being rammed down their throat. So you have to, there's a trade off on the money. Yeah. And and the money is, there's a fortune to be made. Yeah. Out. I mean, an awful lot of money. It's like every time you ever see, you know, a TV show and they go, um, and we flew our contestants over to America and there'll always be a shot of an airplane. You think, yeah. well, they've, okay, that that's the airplane there. You know, they've all got free flights, the whole crew, everyone's got free flights, or they'll show the kind of front of the hotel. And you think, well, everyone's got a free hotel, so you can get payment in kind and things like that. The BBC find it much, much, much harder um, because you can't have product placement at all on the BBC, um, even to the extent that, you know, you'll watch, you know, a, a cookery show and they'll say, do you know the absolute secret to a shepherd's pie is I put um, yeast extract in there. Yeah. And that's because someone has just said, I put Marmite in there. And they said, I'm really sorry, we can't say Marmite, you have to say yeast ex extract. Or they go, Wait. And clothing, which is constantly mm, has blurred. to be completely plain or pixelated yeah. at the tiniest logo. Yeah, if you ever if you ever come as a contestant on a TV show and you have to bring along all your stuff, you cannot have anything that has, you know, you couldn't even have like a little uh, Adidas logo. You couldn't even have the three stripes. Yeah. You can't have anything at all like that. You also can't have anything, yeah, that's going to clash with the background. It's almost impossible to wear. It. That's why everyone on, on quiz shows sort of wear pastel shirts. That's like every man ever on a TV show has got a short sleeve pastel shirt. because Which he's never worn before or since. Yeah, exactly. Unless they win. This is the yeah. shirt, then it becomes yeah. a lucky shirt. Which is exactly. But they've literally picked it up from MS like on the way or, or, or <laughs> wardrobe just has like a, just ra rails and rails of, uh, of, of pastel shirts for men that don't clash with the background of the set. They don't have busy checks on them or anything like that. Um, so the BBC find it harder. You know, they'll say, oh, we're making our version of an ice cream dessert. You go. That's a Vionetta. I'm yeah, sorry. sorry. Yeah. That is yeah. not. We all know that's a Vionetta. So yeah, any anything that's um, a name you, you can't say at all on the BBC. But now you know companies are making whole shows. Marks and Spencers have got inside Marks and Spencer. They have got lots of different things. And there's a limit to even on Channel Four or, 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 or Five or ITV. There's a limit to how many times you can mention a product. And if you've mentioned it three times, you then have to sort of start describing it as something else. So with that, you could say Marmite a couple of times. But from then on, we got our oral trend at yeast extract. Yeast extract. I mean, in, the, in the spirit of this, I'm going to make, make a quick little bit of housekeeping, which was that last week when we were talking about Channel 4, we said that ITV and Channel 5 didn't have public service obliga obligations. They do, of course, what I meant was that they are not publicly funded. So we just let, let us correct that. We wish not to be a, a yeast extract to people this year. Exactly. And if I can also add something, I just say I'm really enjoying my PG tips. It is so refreshing, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Not even not even sponsored. You've done that for free. Although we're available to be, you know, if Yorkshire Tea want to come and make a counter offer. Can they, Yorkshire Tea seem to, Yorkshire Tea are just, uh, I'm mad on the socials. They sponsor everything or they get involved in everything. They get involved in every fight, beef, whatever. You know? Yeah, they should. Yeah, they had that brilliant one where the guy was furious when he discovered that the tea wasn't from Yorkshire. He said, it comes from India. 
He said, come on. And they were like, oh, okay, I don't know what to tell you about tea. But yeah, listen, get in touch, Yorkshire Tea. So that's product placement. Oh, here's a good one. Richard, Fraser Webster says, I love your podcast and both of you. But that's, a good, that's a good way to start, great, isn't it? Yeah. That's if you want your question read out. Oh, I feel a That's the way coming. to start. But it strikes me that Richard loves pretty much everything on TV. Can he wax lyrical for a second about something that he doesn't like? The news or question time does not count. Oh, that's clever. That's <laughs> yeah, clever. A little see, codicil at the end. Well done, Fraser. Shut, he's closed you off there. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a. by and large, my rule is always, you know, with tweeting or, or, or anything, if you like something, talk about it. If you don't like something, don't talk about it. It's that's hard to... literally half my career, so I have no, I know. no, a, no yeah. I have no such qualms. Yeah, exactly. It's and still, I think listen, Fraser knows that. That's why. Yeah, you know what? Fraser's been very clever there. He's trying to drive a wedge between us, isn't he? He's going, Marina, you don't, you don't have any problems stacking things about that idiot. There's nothing I mean, he loves you don't everything. like on television. Uh, there's loads of things I don't like. I tend not to talk about them because it's hard to make television programs. No one's trying to make a bad program. Uh, I don't like it when stuff is lazy. I don't like it when, uh, I don't like it on daytime TV when they absolutely, all every voiceover is full of puns, right? And every voiceover is full of puns because of, Dave Lamb's voiceover on Come Dine With Me, which yeah. changed date on television forever. Because they went, oh, wait, we can do jokes and we can, we can, you know. Truly iconic. Yeah, but Dave Lamb writes that and with his producers at, yeah. and is really, really good at it. And ever since then, just endless daytime TV shows which have that sort of slightly jokey voiceover. And every time there's a pun, they have to, boom, they have to hit it like like banging a drum. They go, oh, no, can you just say um, uh, that is an excellent idea because it's about eggs. And you go, listen. If a pun works, just say it, right? <laughs> if you have to go, that is an excellent idea, right? So that I cannot stand. If ever I see that, and, it, and daytime TV and often some evening shows as well, they, they when they hit those puns like that, you think that is not humour, right? Dave Lamb is funny. He's not. Do, he'll do puns sometimes, but, you know, he'll lighten them up with actually being funny about the contestants and having, you know, a genu genuine comic timing. So the puns in daytime television uh, I don't like. Um, we talked a lot about the traitors. I've just been watching the Australian traitors series too. I, I have trouble with the casting on that because some of the least insightful people in the entire world are on that show. <laughs> and I found it quite a difficult watch at times. Traitors series one, Australia, one of the best traitors of all times. Yeah. Absolutely brilliant. Uh, the host of Australian traitors, Roger Corsa, I love. I think he's amazing. But this series, honestly, I mean, watch it because it's still the traitors and it has this great twist and turns and this, this, that and the other. But there's three or four contestants in that who will absolutely drive you mad. I mean, literally to the extent I was like, I honestly, I don't know if I can watch the next episode. I, ca I <laughs> cannot continue to watch these people driving this bus off this cliff. Uh, and so, yeah, listen, there's, there's, there's uh, shows I, <laughs> that, that, that I don't love. Uh, but, uh, and there's a, there's a, do you know what I've got? This is fun. Yeah. I just, I mean, I could maybe, maybe Fraser, Fraser has changed me. I just want to me. say that I, we're going to draw this out of him as a, over a period of many moons. And we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll draw, we'll draw more of this out. Can we, can we put an asterisk on Fraser's question? And just return to it every few weeks. Yes, that's fun. So Fraser, the we, perma we, question. That, the perma question, exactly that. Well, five one for you as well. That will that will just get under your skin. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. So yeah, there's there's stuff that. But when I don't like it, I really I really get mad. Yeah. Paul Ingram and I'm sitting there going, how can they? How can this be on TV? That's how can they have made that decision and then still thought this was a good idea and put it on television? I get honestly, it drives me bonkers. But yeah, I'm not going to listen. Life's too You're short, not going to say it? that on air. Well, no. I'm going to try and get you to say those sort of things on air. Marina, I have a question for you, but before I do, we have some any other business. Nick Holland has been in touch. He says, here is a possibly an EastEnders doof doof moment for you. Uh, we've talked a lot about gladiators, Bradley Walsh and Barney Walsh's son, who present it. By the way, still doing great guns on uh, on BBC One. Huge audiences still. Yep. Uh, Nick says, Barney Walsh's mum... I presume is Bradley Walsh's wife, yeah. Donna Darby, used to be the lead cheerleader on the original Gladiators. That's cool, isn't it? The cheerleaders were called G-Force, and they're the one thing <laughs> the new series seems to have done away with. Yeah. Uh, the last place you will see cheerleaders is the darts, by the way. It's the one thing they won't, they refuse to get rid of. And according to Jet, Diane Newdale, uh, Bradley Walsh first met Donna on the set of <gasps> Gladiators in the 1990s. Wow. So it's a family business. Why has he done a little bit saying, I met my wife on this show? Might Maybe he has in the interviews, but I've, I haven't seen it. That's very cool, isn't it? Okay, very so good. He met his wife, and I was about to say Barney met his mum. 
but yeah, you, but that's you not know how it works. Yeah, that's not it's not how <laughs> it works. Don't spoil it, but yeah. that's not how it works. <laughs> Thank you, Nick. Uh, Marina, question for you from Ron. Just one name. Okay. Why is there such a big difference in the number of episodes in a season between British shows and US shows? The answer to that mainly is there are um, um, smaller writing teams on British shows. Um, and we've historically had things written by one person, two person, you know, sometimes there'll be three. Almost everything on US television, in comedy, drama, whatever, is written by writers' rooms and they are big. They have a lot of, lo a lot of people in it and that can sustain a 20-episode 20 season, 20 season, whereas we might have a six-episode season. That, in fact, in the most recent WGA strike, one of the things they were asking for was like a minimum minimum staffing in writers' rooms, which is a lot compared to anything that is on the you know we don't have any of that in in the UK, um, but it, there was an exception to it which everyone called the Mike White clause. Now Mike White is the guy who writes the White Lotus, and he's almost unique in American television in that he writes the whole show, and you just don't have that. They just do not have it, and. Partly what they do is partly what the reason of that is they've they invest a huge amount of money in these shows and they want bang for their buck and they want to have many many episodes per season particularly in the days of the old networks and they want to continue coming back season after season. We also have a thing in um, it's a cultural thing as well in this country we have a thing where you can where people say you know I've made two six episode series of say the office mm. and ricky gervais can say i think that was where it should end i think we did everything we wanted to do now i don't know how many seasons the u.s version of the, which was by the way was brilliant but they yes. had many episodes per far more than six episodes per series and it went on for i don't know what would i say nine, nine, nine seasons season. yeah i think it's like 20 episodes uh, times nine yeah. seasons yeah and it was it was absolutely brilliantly done but you need huge amounts of writers to do that and to keep it at a good quality level um and we have always culturally had things that are brilliant we love more than anything and last for two seasons um because that's when the creators want to stop them if you're signing a, a deal for a u.s you know i'm that various sort of development deals i've done with u.s television and deals for shows that have gone, gone to air you are, they're not saying, oh, yeah, you, do you want us, us to invest huge amounts of money in this show and the development of it, then make it, and then you're allowed to walk off after two seasons Two seasons if you don't like it. You've got, you've, you're, if it works and it becomes successful, you're sort of contracted to stay around. You have to have the option of staying for seven seven years, really, in something like comedy. Seven is the key, isn't seven it? Is you, the you, key. You seven, seven is the key. If you, you're effectively signing, yeah. if it goes well, a seven-season deal on something because they want you to stay you can't just say well i think we've done everything we'd like to do with yeah. these characters but that's why season eight of any big long-running american sitcom is interesting because that's when the steve carell's leave is when donald glover leaves community yeah uh you know it's that i was think um it's always sunny in philadelphia is amazing because they're, yeah. they're on like season 15 and they've all stuck around they're all like yeah. no this is a this is a lot of fun but that's you know the, the joy of finding an american sitcom you like is suddenly there are 200 episodes of it for you so if it's a community or an office or brooklyn 99 uh, and you watch two episodes you go i love this you go well you got your next couple of months of every night you can watch two episodes of this because it goes on and on and on it's such a joy and that yeah you're you're quite right that but they wanted you to have that feeling because yeah. of syndication you could not syndicate a show yeah. in america i.e rerun it unless it had 100 episodes. So you really want to get to that magic number and then it can be rerun and it can become very successful and go even on different carriers. In the UK, we can rerun anything. We don't need to get to yeah. 100 episodes before we, we we wouldn't have a whole lot to rerun. Um, and so that was a really big part of it. So yes, if you get into something and they wanted you to get into it and they wanted it to rerun for years and years and years and they have these huge kind of behemoth shows like, I don't know, I Love Lucy or Seinfeld. whatever that went on forever. Yeah. yeah. And that's what they wanted. You had to get to 100 episodes or it couldn't be syndicated. And that's where the real money comes in for yeah. the creators as well. Interestingly, that's also coming back, you know, the key with Netflix and some of the other streamers is that thing of returnability, that thing of comfort watching where, you know, you just stick up, you know, anytime you're anyway, you think, oh, there's an episode of Friends. I will watch that. And we've sort of lost that with binge watching. You don't wouldn't sort of watch an episode of Ozark, you know, and actually that's the thing they want to get back is those shows that whenever they are on, you will just watch it. But yeah, having a big, big old writing room is the way to do it. And the question well, why don't we do that over here if it's so insanely profitable, is 19 times out of 20, 
those shows completely fail and it's just yeah. we, we we've only heard we of ju- and friends we and fraser and yeah we and it, you, we don't we don't we don't spend the same amount of money they have far more potential eyeballs but although nowadays when you can see everything on and you can see uk stuff on you know dairy girls can go to netflix mm-hmm. and just become a huge hit all over again but imagine if there were like 100 150 episodes of dairy girls how happy would we be That'd be wonderful, wouldn't it? If you just think, because I would spend, you know. See, I'm culturally, I think they told it, she told it brilliantly, Lisa McGee, and she did it in the way she did it, and she went out as she wanted. I'm actually, it's just different. It's just yes. different. It doesn't mean that I, I really love the US office, for instance, but I also love the UK office, and it's a it's a totally different, That that is a very good show for looking at the completely different way in which the two countries treat it. Now, now I want to watch 150 episodes of Derry Girls. <laughs> uh, uh, Ron, gosh, we, uh, good we expanded one, on that. Yeah. Thank you very much, Ron. Okay, here we go. We've got a question from Darren Fletcher. <laughs> Darren, Darren Fletcher, the football commentator, uh, yeah, or, I, the, or the former Man United midfielder. Yeah, I was. It, I, it, it could just be someone called Darren Fletcher, and it's a follow up to the. Hold on a minute. Question. What if Ron we just had was Ronaldo? What? <laughs> it's been oh my, Dave Gorman, Ronaldo, Darren Fletcher. Okay, blurb follow up. Darren says, you said that you don't have the time to read in order to provide a blurb when you're writing, but do you also have to stop reading anything in the same genre for fear of contaminating your work, or is it easy to compartmentalise? Nobody wants an inadvertent plagiarism allegation. It's it's, it's such a good question, and and, and every writer will say something different. I mean, the key to writing is you must read all the time. Uh, You know, that's otherwise, why are you writing a book? You know, you've got to be a reader. Um, what you don't want to read is something that's coming out at the same time as your book and is better than yours or something that's terrible. You don't want to read bad writing and you don't want to read writing you're jealous of. That's I think when you're in the middle of writing, after writing, read the best books in the whole world. But while you're writing, you, you it's, it's a you know, my brother who you know is in Sweden, he said that the thing is you, you have to listen to music from the 60s and 70s because you, you can't, while you're recording, you can't listen to your contemporaries because it's too it's too much. Uh, and I I, th- I think it's the same as that. When I when I was writing the very first book, I hit upon all the Patricia Highsmith Ripley novels. Yeah. Because they're brilliant. So I'm, my brain is not getting smaller by reading them. Um, they have a style that's sort of impossible to copy. So you can't sort of take on board in any sort of mannerisms. And uh, she's dead, so she's 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 not a rival. In, in in any way so that that's the ideal combination and the book i'm writing at the moment which is going to be announced next tuesday i wonder if we can announce it on the podcast i think we better i'll actually. talk to so you don't get a podcast exclusive with that yeah, yeah. quite gross I'll t- i know but they, they everyone wants an exclusive that's the oh, trouble but, is, but they is, all want a piece of you yeah they all yeah, yeah. let's we're cut having, that bit out oh uh, no yeah <laughs> keep that we're bit having in. a piece of it yeah have a piece of that um so the book i'm uh writing at the moment I, i'm i'm reading middle march for the first time i've never read it before and again it's brilliant I'm not suddenly going to write like George Eliot, uh, and spoiler alert, she is no longer with us. So it's it's one of those. Wait, per- she's a woman. <laughs> Wait a minute, George Eliot. Hang on a second. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it, it's it's a it's a really good question. So I, I don't think writers, by and large, read stuff that's in their own genre while they're writing. They do, of course, straight afterwards. You can go back and do it. So I think you have to try and find stuff that makes you a better human being. I Be- really feel like when I'm writing a column, if I get up early in the morning and I want to write a column about something, I just won't read, I certainly wouldn't read anyone else's yeah. column about it. And I, that's, you have a very limited, well, my deadlines give me a certain amount of time. You have a limited amount of, you know, very limited amount of time to write the column. I might write it in two or three hours. If I'm thinking of a column that someone else yeah. ha- had, has written, it's really easy to trust. You just, I just don't read it because then you think if I've, I've unfortunately replicated all the same ideas. I once actually wrote an almost identical column to a friend of mine oh. about a story, um, which, no, which was really funny. And we looked at it and we were like, this is such a mind meld. We was, both... it, uh, was, was it Marina Jekyll? <laughs> It was a friend of mine, Matthew Norman, and we both. There's a story about some secretary who had done um, some sort of scam on her boss or whatever, and we'd both written it. I mean, almost word for word, via the Dolly Parton nine to five song and the movie. At Go- <laughs> and it was. I mean, it was almost identical. It was really odd, um, but that was just a sort of strange occurrence. But I try. Then you can legitimately say, "I'm terribly sorry. I have not actually read your thing." Um, but I, I definitely think of sometimes when you're just in a hurry in your writing. If someone's put it very well, it's really hard to think to, of the slightly different way that you'd put the same thing, even if you've had that thought completely independently, which you probably have done. So I just find it much easier to not read anybody's things. The plagiarism thing is easy. You're never going to copy someone's 
sentence in a book. But when someone's when you're reading a great stylist, you do sometimes the next day, you know, if I'm reading John le Carre, uh, and I'm thinking, oh, I you try and work out why is he a much better writer than me? Okay, so what's what is he? What is it he's doing? Uh, and but it it sort of gets into your head, and suddenly you start the, the introduction to the next chapter that you're writing. You go, is it a bit more involved than you normally do? You're sort of describing the surroundings a bit more, and people are being a bit more shifty. You think, yeah, you were just reading John Le Carre, you idiot. <laughs> and then you, you then occasionally you sort of you you know then you have to row it back. But you know the whole point about writing is you are a collection of your influences. And so when you do read someone that you think, I love the way this is written, and you, you, and you can roughly work out why you love it, then that you take all of you that You learn so much from it. Board. And it actually, as you say, it becomes a sort of adapted recipe and you all sorts of other ingredients go into it. And it's p part of finding your voice. Yeah, exactly that. But uh, it's, it's a genuinely great question. And it's something that, that writers often talk about. That it's, there are certain books it is impossible to read <laughs> when you're writing. Thank you, Darren. And also great work on either the commentary or the, uh, or, or the football, whichever, whichever Dar Darren Fletcher you are thank you so much for all your questions that was fun yes it was great our producers just said there's literally a warehouse full of all these questions but please keep sending them in because they're so good the rest is entertainment at gmail.com and we'll be back on tuesday with a with an exclusive on my book if uh, if if the lawyers at penguin allow but also what are they gonna i mean what are the lawyers at penguin gonna do this is i officially speaking to the lawyers at penguin now what are, are you they now wishing to come and get me please to the lawyers at penguin yeah i i am exactly come and sue me come and sue me and i might spend the week trying to find some more tv i i, I don't like because I, I rather enjoyed that i won't you know that i won't i look forward to hearing about it i'll find plenty <laughs> uh we'll see you on tuesday everyone bye-bye <laughs>